who have been a part of John's story. Um, and uh, any of you thinking about psychology and graduate studies, uh, Dora is in the master's program here in psychology. Um, but anyway, John's um, been in and out of trouble for many years. And uh, I think a lot of what we talked about in the last several weeks regarding theories of criminal behavior probably apply one way or another to John's story. Um, John is one of these successes and has come a long way in a number of years here. So, but I'll let you, I'll let John talk and, and I'll let you apply what we've talked about here to John, Jay, okay? And you don't need to take any notes at all. None of this will be on your exam. I just want you to enjoy this and maybe apply some of what we've learned to, to Jay. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate the opportunity. It is an honor to be here before you guys. I hear you, some of you guys are going to be lawyers and, you know, uh, judges maybe. I don't know. Um, but uh, We hope not lawyers. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I've given a couple of presentations prior to this one. I've been giving some in Big Springs. Uh, I like to call them motivational speeches. I have come a long ways, and, and sometimes the first time I was kind of prepared, and all the other times I'm like, okay, I'm just going to speak from the heart because, you know, sometimes I know it's best to have your piece of paper and go by because when it comes to dates and times, I don't remember half the dates and times. My mom would probably be able to share the dates and times. Um, my aunt was so awesome, and she printed me out uh, a flyer per se, and so she uh, did that last minute, and I'm just very grateful that I have a support system through my aunt. She was also one of the ladies that helped me start my business in the very beginning. So, where do we begin? Um, I was born and raised in Big Spring, Texas. Um, I had a very good uh, family, very, very supportive family. Um, I think that one of the reasons that I had went the other direction was because when I was in uh, elementary and I played baseball and football and stuff like that, I remember seeing dads always there with their children. Um, and so I kind of reflect and reminisce about those days and I, I, I believe with all my heart um, that those were one of the reasons why I might have gone rebellious or started you know, being rebellious. Um, while the kids were out there, you know, playing baseball and their little games, you know, I could always hear the father in the background say, go son, go son. And so I think in the back of my mind, that was one of the reasons that I, I was hurting. Uh, of course, my mom and my family, um, they were there every game. Uh, you know, it might have been a game or two where they had to miss due to work. But nonetheless, I did have a very strong support system. Um, when we were raised and brought up, you know, I just found out recently that my my grandmother slash mother, because she raised me, so I, I used to call her mom, um, because my mom was always working, um, that there were times she went without eating just so she'd make sure that the kids would eat. And so that was very touching to me, to hear that what my grandma and grandpa did for us as children, you know, we didn't even see it. You know, but I remember her waking up early, early in the mornings, uh, making tortillas, papas fritas con carne picada, um, you know, hamburger meat, potatoes, and stuff of that nature. But anyway, so I, I, I really had a good upbringing. Um, I started getting into um, drugs and alcohol at a very young age. Uh, it really started with my smoking cigarettes. And one of the stories I always share is the time that I blackmailed my sister. Uh, and I think that was actually the first criminal thought that I did because I actually blackmailed my sister. Um, it started where uh, mom smoked at that time. And so she used to have this big old freaking ashtray. It probably weighed 20 pounds, right? But she would smoke cigarettes, right? And she would put them out. And some would be halfway. And I remember I'd pocket them. And um, I'd go to the back of the yard and I'd light up a cigarette. Well, me and my cousin, we would both start to smoke around the same time. And then one day we were out there smoking and my sister 
opened up the door. We're in the back. She opens up the door and she's like, you're smoking. So I'm immediately freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, she's going to tell mom. So what did I think? Immediately, like really quick, I said, well, you know what? If she smokes, she can't, she can't do nothing because then I could use that against her. And I know this sounds harsh, guys. Don't do this at home. Don't do it to your nephews or nieces or your little brothers and sisters. But I literally grabbed her nose, grabbed the lit cigarette, put it in her mouth. Well, eventually she's going to have to breathe, right? So when she breathed, she coughed up or sucked in all that smoke and started coughing up a storm. And so I was like, you can't tell them now because now you smoke. So that's kind of what I use in the background. I don't know if I ever told mom that story, but you know, those, that's what I did. And uh, not long after that, by the way, that is my mother, Aurora. Um, mom, this is the group. <laughs> so, but you know, I, I often reflect on that because I think, you know, even though that was an innocent thing that I did, so to speak, um, you know, I never thought that cigarettes would be uh, an opening or a, what do they call it? Um, Gateway. Yes, a gateway to doing other things. And after I studied and, and, and was, you know, I did 13 and a half years in the penitentiary, uh, in and out, federal and state. Um, but I never realized that it was a gateway. And sure enough, it wasn't long after that, I would say maybe a year or two after that, that I actually started smoking pot. So I'm, I'm thinking eight, nine years old, um, I started getting high and, and, you know, I did it very subtly, you know, nobody knew I was smoking. It wasn't until probably 11 or 12 that I actually started getting busted all the time by my mom or my grandmother. And they were like, gee, though your eyes are bloodshot red. What are you doing? I'm like, you know, I mean, what could I say? You know, I was, I was high. Um, of course, during that time between 11 and 16 years of age, I got uh, that adrenaline rush by breaking into people's houses. Um, and again, you know, we had food on the table. You know, uh, my mom worked some long hours and got me things that other children couldn't afford, you know, like guitar, you know, stereos and stuff like that. But I wanted more. And when I uh, broke into my first home, um, the guy that, that helped me break into this home, he he was a poor guy. They didn't have very much money, and so he did it to buy drugs. Of course, me at that time, I wasn't doing it to buy drugs because I had someone whose mother and father sold drugs, and we got it free. And, I mean, literally, every day. I mean, we there were pounds and pounds of weed in their refrigerator, and I would go in there while they were asleep, get a couple of buds out, and I'd have enough for the week. You know, and I did it every 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 week. But um, anyways, I say that to say this is that you know I, I I when I broke into that house and I got that rush and that feeling, you know, it kicked in a different high, and it, it was like, and it, and mind you, this is the first. Well, actually, by that time, I think I was sixteen because I did get busted for that one. Um, there was various ones that we already broken into, so this was like the. Uh, let me re uh, backtrack. It was like probably the fifth house we broke it into, but this one we actually got busted. And um, we had got went inside the the bedroom and we got the sheet out. This guy had a bunch of guns, uh, shotguns and whatnot, and we rolled them up in the the sheet. And one guy held one end, and the other guy held the other, end, and we ran out the door. Well, as we were running out the door, I could hear footsteps. And when I turned around, I had this seventy year old man chasing me down and boy we started running even faster guns were falling all over and one of the guns went off i guess it was loaded obviously it was and it scared the crowd out of me and i dropped everything and just burned off well by that time the guy that was waiting for us driving around the block he picked me up of course i was drenched in sweat um and of course there was a lady involved and she didn't even get caught up in the mix. And so um, anyways, um, I went down to the Howard County Jail um, and so they uh, sat me down with the victim. Here you go guys. And so uh, 
what broke me, and, and it really broke me, it broke my spirit, is when they sat me, and they sat me literally on kind of table like that, and I sat down, the, the guy that I victimized was sitting in front of me, and, and he was just bawling. And he says, do you realize how hard my family works to get what we get for you to come in, break my door, and steal everything? And, and, and it's just the way that he said it that it broke me, and it made me realize, okay, stealing is not for me. And so, needless to say, I never stole like that again. You know, I never broke into anyone else. But I did get put on probation as a juvenile. Um, I think I went, uh, was tried as an adult at the age of 17 and ended up going to a, uh, like a real hip rehabilitation center in Abilene, Texas. Um, and I started working over there. Of course, I already knew what I was going to do. I was gonna get my first paycheck and burn off because I didn't want to go to this rehabilitation. I wanted to party and do all the drugs that I was doing. Um, so when I got my first paycheck, this is in Abilene, when I was in Abilene, Texas, um, I got my first paycheck and right around the corner from Taco Bueno where I worked at was a friend that I had met who was a drug dealer, you know? So the old saying that, oh, you gotta leave your hometown, it's infested with drugs, it doesn't matter where you go, drugs are gonna be everywhere. It's what you wanna do with your life and how to do it. Um, of course, you know, this guy, uh, got me a, a ticket back to Big Springs and it wasn't maybe two weeks after that that they found me, violated me, and now I was headed to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. One of the thoughts that I will never forget are the chains. Uh, you know, it's called the, the chain, chain day. It's, it falls on uh, the end of every month on a Friday or Saturday, like three or four o'clock in the morning and everybody that's get, been get sent to Texas Department of Criminal Justice, you know, you get told like eight hours before that chain comes or the bus, the TVC, the J bus to pick you up. And so every month you can hear the rattling of these chains and, 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 and what goes through your heart and through your mind, the intensity of knowing that you're fixing to go to the unknown is probably by far the most overwhelming slash scared thing you could ever imagine um, you know because you hear the stories and back in the late 80s early 90s you know there was so much gang activity going on that you know people were getting killed uh, by other inmates and um, uh, guards were involved to the point where they would pass certain uh, tools to get to these individuals in order to take them off take them out and so there was just so much going on um, that you don't know which prison you're gonna go to. And so what happened to me is, like everybody says, you know, everybody goes to jailhouse religion. You know, you go to jail, you start praying, and you know, hey, God don't send me to a bad prison. Well, unfortunately for me, that wasn't the case. Um, I did go to a unit at the Jester Three or Jester One trustee camp. That was in 1988-89, uh, and I was a trustee, right? As a trustee, I had the liberty to go out outside the prison and do certain things, but my mentality and my criminal thinking, I was gonna hustle, so what did I do? There was a guard who uh, was bringing in tobacco. I mean, not tobacco, it was weed, because tobacco was still okay to smoke, but he was bringing in weed, and for a little matchbox of, of marijuana, they were running $100, $150 for a little box, you know? And so the guards would give it to us, and of course, they're the ones that shake us down going in and out. And so if you were uh, connected with this particular uh, officer, then he would just, you know, real quick, and then let you right in the doors. And that's how we got the drugs. And of course, later down the line, it got worse. You know, uh, people were sticking them in areas you shouldn't be sticking stuff out, you know? And so, um, uh, I always had the hustle and the ability to make money. Now, of course, I started to draw and uh, do other hustles, such as doing legal stuff for individuals that couldn't afford it. So that was another hustle I did, because I didn't want to sell drugs inside a prison system, because if you get caught, you get a whole new case, uh, thus getting more time. Uh, 
but I did acquire the abilities and the techniques to, to draw, and I made quite a bit of money doing that kind of stuff. But anyways, um, after that, you know, it was just a, 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 a revolving door for me. I was in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, and I wasn't affiliated with any gangs at that particular time. Uh, it wasn't until I went back, I believe the third time, that um, I got there at the uh, Navasota, Texas, at the PAC-2 unit. It's recently named the O.L. Luther unit. Um, and while I was in Huntsville, there's a process that you go through. You've got intake, which is a diagnostics unit. That's where everybody goes. Or if you're from West Texas, like we are, they'll send you to the Abilene um, prison, which is known as um, John Middleton, and that's your intake. And then from there, you will wait approximately seven to 14 days, and they will transfer you over to the uh, Huntsville at the uh, diagnostics unit. And there you will spend seven to 14 days as well. Once you go through that, then they send you to a third facility or the second, whichever way TDC decides to do you. Um, I always ended up going straight to Huntsville. Um, they send you to the psychology uh, department where they evaluate you and they find out if you're sane or you're going to go to a maximum security prison or whatever. Um, now these cells are only, I believe, eight by 10 feet cells, really, really small. You have two bunks made out of metal. They give you a little mattress about that big. There's no air conditioner. Um, I remember, I mean, if I could count, I would say at least a couple of people, couple of hundred people died because of heat exhaustion. Um, a guy committed suicide right next door to my cell. I see the blood, it went into mine. In fact, I, our toilets were broke because people had a riot and they flushed a bunch of toilet paper in there. And I know this is a little gross, but I asked to use the bathroom where the guy actually just died. Officers go ahead. So I went in there, and I sat down, blood going down the hill, and people asked me, he said, does that not bother you? I'm like, no. You know, but those are the type of things that, that, that as the lifestyle that I was living and getting to a time of my life where to me life didn't matter, although I had the support group for my family, I just really didn't care. You know, I, I, I wanted to be evil. I wanted to be mean. I wanted people to be scared of me. And so, yes, I got involved with a uh, prison gang uh, known as West Texas. Now, back then, it was called Del West, which means the West, D-E-L West. And then it changed to West Texas, and then 432, and uh, it just keeps changing. But uh, when I got involved with that, they do what they call Cora checks. And a Cora check is a heart check uh, to see how much um, strength you have, whether you're going to turn. Uh, the, one of the, the weak points that they have that will, they will not tolerate is the way we did it, we did seven on one. So seven guys would get on you and they would smash you for 30 seconds, 20 seconds. We had a maximum of two minutes. Whenever I was in charge, I did a one hour um, without them punching back. You cannot punch back for one minute. And then the second minute, you can protect yourself so that we can see the skills that you had to figure out where you were gonna fit in our little gangs because every gang is orchestrated uh, in different areas, you know, whether it's politicians dealing with the drugs, you know, everybody had the task. And so uh, uh, when they did my court, I checked, um, I don't think I lasted a minute and I was out of breath. By that time I fell down, but what they will not tolerate is if you curl up and once you curl up and you start screaming, you're done. So what happens to those guys is they sell you. Now back then they would sell you and you would, uh, they would do various things. Either they would trade you out to different gangs and they would do things to you that, you know, you could imagine everything. Uh, or number two, you would pay, uh, a, uh, not a ransom, but uh, you'd pay with commissary. They'd charge you like anywhere from $50 to a hundred dollars. So if your family had money, they would send money to your commissary. You would write a commissary list of what the gang members wanted and then they would protect you. And so those are some of the things that I got into and not realizing later down the line it would bite me in the butt. Um, but I've seen so much tragic, um, you know, I've, I've seen, well, not 
physically seeing with my own two eyes, but I would hear men screaming in the middle of the night, three or four o'clock in the morning, because they were being sexually molested. It wasn't until a few years ago that TDCJ came out with a new law called PREA, this uh, uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act. And I actually became involved with that to help these individuals dealing with certain things, uh, whether they were molested or they were just jumped by another gangs. But I did it to for selfish reasons. And um, what that did is it got me access to a list of individuals that would come in to uh, so we could find out who they were before they hit the yard. Uh, and so yes, I did that for selfish reasons for my gang. Um, and that would give us the ability to go and find out, okay, well, this dude's from West Texas. Uh, usually on the papers that the officers have, I would have access to. So I would go in there and I would check to see if there were 5K1, which means you were a snitch. Uh, those were the codes, you know. And so we were able to tell who was tattle tattle teller and who wasn't. And so a lot of these things, they intrigued me, but you know, although that sounds all bad, you know, I actually did try to help some of these guys. There was a few guys that I helped um, with their process of going through prison. I'd sit down with them and I would mentor them uh, and talk to them. And I finally got in an area so high, uh, to me, I guess you would call it like a general in, um, in the army or the air force or whatnot. I was like a general and so Anytime I got transferred from different prisons, they would put me in what they call a CM or the seat uh, uh, because of my my uh, history of being affiliated with this gang. Uh, gosh, I think I was in there eight, nine years where I was in charge of hundreds of men in prison. But um, back, let's go back a little bit and kind of uh, focus on how I ended up getting there. Um, I started shooting drugs. Um, started smoking crack. Now at one point in my life, I felt like I was on the top of the world because I felt like some of the guys would nickname me the Mexican Scarface. Now I didn't make millions and millions of dollars like you see the movie on Scarface, right? But because of the money that I had and the cars that I was driving, I always felt like, you know, I was just living it up. You know, I lived at strip clubs. That was my thing. Go to strip clubs, get drunk, get wired, and you know, bring all these women home at, on the weekends and stay for three or four days. And, you know, and to me, that was the life at the time. Of course, I never uh, was comfortable because every time I was driving, I always had to look behind my back. And that is probably the worst feeling, knowing you've got a kilo of cocaine in your vehicle and you just know you're going to get pulled over, right? You know, I, every morning when I'd get up, I'd go to the back of my truck press my lights, make sure my blinkers work, you know, because uh, what is it, 85% of people that go to prison is because of something stupid, you know, a blinking light, whatever. And so, yeah, those were some of the things that I, I, I went through, um, but the most horrific part of being incarcerated, now I hope I'm still online here on the key focus of what we're discussing on this particular criminology class. Um, the worst part is when I hit Ferguson, Texas, uh, uh, not Ferguson, um, is it Ferguson? Uh, the name of the unit is Ferguson, Midway, Texas. Uh, Ferguson was a, uh, at that time, was one of the hardcore prisons ever. And the reason I got sent there is because we just had a riot. Uh, it was the Hispanics against the blacks and we were like, I don't know, there was 72 Hispanics and there was only 27 blacks. And at Navasota, Texas, which I spoke of previous, we had a stainless steel factory. So everything that Texas makes for prisons, and I believe they do them for hospitals, we do our own um, uh, pro produce, we do, we do the Texas uh, signs, the, the license plates, we do all that, okay? But at this particular prison, we did stainless steels. Uh, like the little stainless steel uh, uh, in the cafeterias that you go here and down, TDC does that. And so, needless to say, there were shanks all over that yard. 
I mean, I probably had like 20 shanks, you know, uh, kind of a overkill there, but I did. I had one in my bunk. I had one by the rock next to the to the handball court by the big old blade of grass that nobody ever cuts. So that's how I would identify where my shanks were, you know? And so that day that we had a riot, they went out there with their uh, metal detector and it was just ding, 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 ding. I mean, it's all over. Um, but it was probably one of the most frightening riots, and I've been in about six riots, but to know that everybody in that yard had a shank, it's like, you know, this is the death of me. I'm going to die today. Um, but because our reglas or our regulations to my gang required that you have to fall out, so, for example, I mean, you had the Bloods, the Crips, the, uh, the Black Gorillas, uh, those were the Black Gangs, and Mexican Gangs, you've got a whole bunch of them. You got uh, uh, Tango, you got West Texas, you got Corpitos, San Anto, Mexican Mafia, Texas Syndicate. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing a bunch of them, but there's a bunch of them, okay? Uh, Sudanio 13s or M13s. And they weren't nothing back then, and now they're everywhere. But um, I say that to say this, you know, it was so intense because West Texas, who the gang I was in, we had just separated from uh, EPT, which is El Paso, Texas. Um, their leaders are Aztecas, mm -hmm. and they are very powerful, and it's blood in, blood out, same like Mexican Mafia, same with Texas Syndicate. We were not blood in, blood out, per se. We didn't kill someone to get in. Now, their rules have changed now, and I'm pretty sure that you don't have to kill someone to do it, to get in their game, but you have to do what they call a domain, which is a job. When you do that job, then you're, you're, you're marked, and they start giving you points. And then once you get so many points, they'll give you a feather. And I don't know if you know anybody from that particular game. In fact, I probably should be talking about it. But you accumulate a bunch of feathers and then you become a general. Uh, so we had just separated from them and there was a lot of animosity between us. And uh, we were, people were just killing each other left and right. And, uh, you know, a lot of stuff I can't share because, uh, you know, I know you guys are going to be judges and cops. <laughs> so I'm going to not incriminate myself. <laughs> <Don't worry. laughs> no, but, but I can tell you this. It, it, it's, it's frightening and it's, it's, you know, there were nights that I, I mean, days I wouldn't eat because I was too scared to go eat. You know, you didn't want to go to the mess hall because you know everybody that's running the mess hall is this particular gang or if you're over here on this side, that, because they had like two, two kitchens and one side would eat for protective custody and whatnot and then you had the other ones. Well, then what you you have what they called your your uh, abajo layana, aka um, people that um, uh, like spies, basically. Now I can say I'm with Mexican mafia, but I need to go make a hit on this guy over here. So I would uh, make myself go in protective custody by saying my life's being threatened, and they would send me over to that side, and then I can go and do my hit, get my target right. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't eat. And then at that particular time, they had a, a scandal going on uh, with Vinopro. I don't know if any of y'all know anything about that meat substitutes from Canada, but they were literally using us as guinea pigs. And when I say they were using us, they were literally using the inmates, human people, to eat this stuff and, uh, because they were trying to save money. And the reason that stopped is because uh, the director from TDCJ got busted, and when this, uh, uh, what's the name of the people that drive cars on the highways, the highway patrolmen, <laughs> opened up the trunk, and they found the spider pro. They thought it was heroin. Well, it wasn't. Come to find out, it was spider pro, and they mixed it with water, and it blows up. And the reason we knew that it wasn't good, and like I said earlier, we did all our produce. I worked with the pigs, uh, literally pigs, uh, the slops, you know, <laughs> and we would feed the pigs, right? Well, they would give us a pound of hamburger meat. Now you're supposed to do one quarter Vita Pro and three quarters of actual meat. And then you, when you mix it and cook it together, 
it blows up, right? Well, they were making us feed these pigs and cattle with straight Vitapro. I think we would get a little bit of slop left over and we'd mix it and we'd feed the pigs. Well, one particular day we went out to check the pigs, their freaking tummies blow up and they were all dead. I'm talking two, three hundred dollars, two, three hundred uh, worth of pigs or that many pigs, okay? Uh, and so we knew right there something's wrong. You know, these guys are, are, are feeding us and you know, they were putting it in all our foods, chicken, uh, hamburger meat, and I mean, it was horrible. So I wouldn't go eat either because of that reason as well. Uh, but thank God that that guy got in trouble and they sent him to prison. But anyways, uh, I know I'm kind of running back and forth with different stories, um, but I just want you guys to know that, that it was really hard for me to get back out of prison and then to try to reintegrate with society. You know, because when I would go apply for an application, they would say, are you, do you have a, a crime or have you ever committed a crime? And then I would always put, we'll discuss upon interview. Mm -hmm. Well, nine times out of 10, they would never interview. So things would get frustrated for me to the point where I would go right back to selling drugs. You know, hell, I'll make two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 a week versus, you know, $10 an hour. And then child support was taking the rest of it, so I'd end up with about $100 a month, you know, you know, figuratively speaking, but, um, you know, it was, it was, my mind was set in a criminal thinking because I actually thought I would never make it in this world, not to mention the many people, you know, they say, uh, uh, what's that, uh, Christina Aguilera sings words, won't bring you down or something like that, <laughs> you know, but it does. You know, uh, and what's that old saying? Uh, Stick and stones can't oh, break right us. Yes. Okay. There you have it. But it does. You know. And I remember times, um, even family members, close family members, that say, "Oh, Jay's never going to change. He's he's going to he's going to die a drug dealer. He's going to die a drug addict. It's just a matter of time." So my 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 faith with for myself was gone. You know, I actually felt like, you know, I wasn't going to amount to anything. Um, but had it not been for the support group of my family and the love that they displayed towards me, you know, I, I don't know where I would be today. Of course, I met my wife as well, and, and that played a big part of, of, of me staying straight, sober, because she scares me straight. <laughs> but um, it was like, like, you know, one of the last times I went, I was the type of guy that if I was going to do it, I was gonna do it full force. And that goes back down to jailhouse religion. You know, because 80% of these people, they go to prison because they don't wanna get in trouble, they don't wanna get the gangs to go hit them up. They'll say, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian, you know, or I'm, I'm a Muslim, or whatever religion that you are in prison. Well, because you have those facts, gangs will respect that, but they're watching. When they see you slip, it's bad news for you. You see what I'm saying? It's, you know, you say you're a Christian, but yet you're getting pornography uh, through some individuals or whatever, or whoever's bringing them to you. They're watching you, and then they'll go check you, and they'll hurt you because you're faking it to make it, you know? And that's not what I wanted. I wanted to, to give myself that uh, knowing with all my heart, so and mind that if I did something, I'm gonna do it all the way, and so yes, one of the last times that I went to prison, uh, I was in the county jail, I did uh, accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I felt it, I felt something. And, and, and in my heart of hearts, I'm like, okay, if this is real, you know, show me. And it did, there were certain things that happened. Now, I'm not gonna turn this into a, a sermon or anything like that, but you know, you gotta give credit where credit is due, right? And I will tell you, there was a lot of things that happened miraculously. There's no other way to explain to it except what I felt that day, how it happened. And at that time, my son, uh, and I'm gonna say his name, John Forrest, he was born uh, a cocaine baby, okay? He had a monitor on him and it broke my heart. But I remember to this day, uh, I went around the back uh, smoked me a rock or a shot up, I don't remember which, which one it was, and I was so freaking high that when I walked in there, I was in that baby crib probably two hours checking on him. You know, 
him, is he okay? Is he breathing? I put my ears to him. And in my mind, in my thought process, I'm like, yeah, what am I doing? You know? Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it broke me. It was a lot of things in my heart that it was, it just wasn't normal for me to do these kind of things. And not to mention, you know, the pain I put my mom through, the pain I put through my grandmother, who's no longer here with us, but, you know, she was a tough cookie. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandpa as well. I think I inherited a bunch of his uh, uh, work ethics and, and some of the things that he did, although the mechanical aspect of it, I didn't get. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, <laughs> but, you know, it was, um, it was, it was, Either I'm going to continue this road of, 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 of living this criminal life and die, or I need to change. And so the day that I did finally decide I was going to go 100%, you know, I was giving it a shot. You know, I've tried everything else, but I, I just kept going back, kept going back, kept going back. And so um, I knew that... Uh, if something didn't get done soon, I was either going to end up with a life sentence or a new charge or death. And so I knew that something had to change. And anyways, whenever I did what I did and I, you know, there were just certain things that happened. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, share this with you. I had a guy um, who used to come around the jail cell and every time he'd see me, you're back again, huh? I was like, yeah, I'm back. Is he here on a new case or are you here just on a violation? I said, no, I'm here on a violation. He said, well, that's good. You know, at least you ain't going, getting a whole new federal uh, felony charge. Um, but he asked me, he says, can I pray for you? I'm like, no, bro, I don't want to hear any of that. He said, but here, and in this, these uh, cells, there was a little bitty circular thing uh, through the outside. It was called the catwalk. They can open it and hand you, they would give you candy bars and stuff like that. Where you could fit a little bitty Bible like that. So he handed me that little Bible and I grabbed it and I just browsed through it. And I remember when I opened it, there was one scripture that stood out to me. And it was uh, Mark eleven twenty four. It says, therefore I say unto you that whatsoever you shall pray, believe that you have received it already and it should be given to you. And then the other one um, was... Um, I can't even remember it. Psalms 37, 4. No, Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. That's not it. It says, I have a plan for you, says the Lord. Plans for a future and a hope. Emphasis mine. It's, it's, I just broke it down. And so I remember asking myself, I was like, you know, is, 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 is there really something else for me out there instead of prison? I said, because I'm tired. You know, I'm always... Gosh, I think I didn't get off parole till what, uh, four years ago, something like that. So I've literally been on juvenile probation from, I believe, either 12, 13, heck, it might have even been 11, I don't remember, but I've been on it for a long, long time. Uh, but as I, I, I got that Bible, I remember being angry and I threw it, and I was in the, okay, in the chow hall area where we eat, and my cell was right there by where that door is. So I threw that Bible in it. I didn't know this until that, like, later that night that I actually fell myself. Um, so this guy, he comes back around and he starts talking to me about that same scripture. Coincidence? I thought so. Um, later on that night, when I was in my cell, um, I was just walking back and forth. You know, just walking back and forth. and. When I turned around, I looked down on the floor, and there I could see the Bible. It was open. I mean, it literally like just fell like this on the corner, open to that very same scripture. And so I'm like, wow, that's cool, you know? I mean, what are the odds of, of me throwing that Bible in there and it opens up to that scripture? Well, they say three times the charm. So I went, uh, put on my headphones, didn't think nothing about it. And I was listening to Steve Solomon praising the night. And I'll be darned if this man don't start talking about that exact same scripture. And to add on to that, he says, anytime you hear a scripture, not once, not twice, but even at three times, someone's trying to tell you something. So almost immediately I felt something that just took over me. 
And from that point forward is when I actually started to change my ways. I stopped cussing. Um, it wasn't until I got married to my wife that I started cussing. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I have a very loving wife. Um, but really, in, in, in all reality, you know, um, there comes a time in everyone's life that we're all going to hit rock bottom. You know, we have a choice to do something about it. And like I said, had it not been for the support group of my family to be there for me, uh, because they never, ever uh, quit on me. You know, sometimes we we forget where we come from and we forget that that, you know, uh, we didn't grow up to be, you know, we didn't, we weren't rich when we were younger and, and, and the places that we'd all been through and suffered. And, you know, it's like you, you can do something about it. And I tell my, my, my kids all the time, I said, you know, the world's out there. You, know, you can go out there and you can reach for it. And you can get anything you want if you put your mind to it. And so I just wanted to kind of share. I'm open for questions. I know that this there's going to be some psychology you said, right? Criminology and Criminology, psychology. psychology. But, um, you know, I, I, I would be more than happy to answer any question. You know, I don't get offended. I won't get booty hurt or anything like that. So, I mean, really, if you got some questions, you know, if you want to jot down some information, I don't have no problem with it. I do have a YouTube account uh, where I have some of these uh, stuff here that I will put on there um, just to kind of help me because I need to be a little bit more organized with dates and times and you know I, I, I've tried to start writing a book I've been told many many times by very many people that love me that hey you need to finish that book you know including my pastor and I know I do I know I do because there's so much in there I have to offer you know and, and, and I feel like where I'm at today is better than what I was yesterday but I know that I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. To be able to get here in front of you guys, you know, hell, I did, excuse my word, I just did a job for, for the same guy that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just went and did a big remodeling for the same guy that threw me in prison. You know, who was to know 20 years later or 30 that the same man that put me in jail is actually letting me in his home to do remodeling. So that in itself is a testimonial because if I can do it, anyone can, you know? And, and like I said, I mean, I had loving families. I had uh, very many support groups. Um, I mean, I did the AA and the MAs. I'm doing Celebrate Recovery now. I'm trying to quit smoking. Um, uh, and, and like I said earlier, you know, it, I, I do give credit where credit is due. My wife has been a big contributor in, in my support system. You know, when I do something wrong, immediately she corrects me. Um, you know, and, and I like that, you know. Now, Lord forbid something ever happened between us, and then I'd probably be mom or daughter or any of my aunts to call. And that I can do at any God given time, whether it's 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I can call someone and say, hey, look, I'm going through this. Will you please pray for me? Or just give me some words of advice. And I will tell you that her, uh, Dora Dominguez, Carrie, uh, and also Josie, these guys are always there for me to listen. Just sometimes that's all we got to do is hear someone out. Um, but I think I've said pretty much what I wanted to say. Uh, again, if y'all have any questions, please feel free to ask me because I'm willing to answer anything. How many hours we got left to? <laughs> no, seriously. Anybody? Any questions? How long did you serve time? How long did I serve? I served approximately... 13 and a half years in and out. Um, now, I left out the part that I went and did federal time, but I also did federal time in prison. And that's another story in itself. That's why I would really like to get my book down. Uh, because the federal judge that prosecuted me, at the time I found out I had cancer. And so uh, the attorney that I had acquired to, to help me through this uh, uh, trial He's like, dude, we're going to get you back out. I promise you, you got cancer. They're going to let you back out and reinstate you. I'm like, heck yeah, you know, I was all down. I'm like, heck no. When I went in there, he said, I hereby send you to the best cancer facility in the United States of America. Next. That's all he said. I'm like, okay, I didn't even get a chance. But, you know, it was, it was, it was a God thing because when I went to where I went to, 
uh, the procedures and stuff they did, it was like tens and thousands of dollars. And I got it done for free, you know. I, I, I know I say this uh, in a way, I don't mean to demean anything in that because I know that, you know, we the taxpayers, I'm a taxpayer now. Um, but yeah, they did pay for all of it. And I'm, I'm grateful because had it not been for that, you know, I probably would have been dead by now with cancer. So I'm here alive today before you. And there it is. Anything else? I'm kind of, uh, I have a question really for, I guess for Dora, for Aunt Dora and Mom Aurora. Mm -hmm. Th this must have, this, what John, what Jason is saying here must have had, must have had tremendous impact in your life, you know? What does all this mean to you? I, I know you, you, you probably didn't anticipate getting to ask the question, but I'm kind of <laughs> curious. Because, because when I, when I talk in classes like this, uh, in, in other classes I teach here too, for every, the victims and the of, of a crime are, are not just right. Jay's victims, it's family. His family and everybody is hurt by what he did. And Absolutely, must, must have had a tremendous. Like impact. they say, they're not the only ones that go to, to jail or to prison. The whole family does, yeah. and the families that really care. That is, yes. and it's hard. It's hard because. Um, your struggle to pay your bills and pay your food, and then you struggle because your son want, needs money for this or needs money for that, and, and it's a struggle. And then I thank God every day that uh, he's here now, and and he's the best son I've ever had. Now he was a the, the worst. <laughs> he was the worst when he was young. He was a he wanted to be the the man. I guess I don't know, but. But he's a lot different, and he's the son that, that I've always wanted. And he's right there. Yeah. And I thank God every day. Yes, ma'am. So you've been in the criminal justice system. What, not so much what are your thoughts, but what recommendations would you have to improve the system? And the reason I ask is over the summer, um, I spent some time out at the Ector County uh, Detention Center. Mm -hmm. Or the Ector County Youth Center, excuse yes. me. Yes. And, um, you know, and while I was there, I got to interact with the, the youth who were through just the residents there at the youth center. And I, when you, you look at those young people and you, you know, there's part of you just wants to reach out and, you know, shake them mm -hmm. and, and love them. Beat the crud out of them. Huh? <laughs> but, um, so you look at the system and clearly, something's not right with the system because the system is growing. Right. That's a lot to say, I guess, to ask the question, how do we, Change. I'm not gonna say fix it, but how do we at least get on a path to maybe make it better? You've been it through that, you've experienced it, so I feel like you have a very uh, interesting perspective. Yes, ma'am. So, your thoughts? Um, for being on the inside and being on the outside, I've been involved with various um, uh, entities such as Kairos and Emmaus now. Um, a lot of these nonprofit organizations will actually go into the prison and will help reintegrate <coughs> these individuals to help them uh, cope when they're released. Some of them have even offered jobs to these individuals. Um, but on the inside and being part of the inside, um, after being locked up for so long, I mean, I've read books from psychology, sociology, physiology, and, and, and one of the things that I, I learned to find out like recently was um, the atmosphere and, and colors of your walls, you know, how now if you go to a federal prison and you walk into it, you're going to see light colors. You're not going to see red, you're not going to see black, because those colors bring anger and, and stuff, and they've learned to realize now that Certain colors does have an effect on individuals um, psychologically. Um, but what would make it better? Okay, we do know that TDCJ just passed a law um, where they're going to start incorporating air conditionings into these. Like I said before, uh, I don't know how many deaths I heard of or seen where people were dying because of heat exhaustion. Um, some of the, the, the cells would get up to 114. 150 degrees. So when you're in there and you're, you're butt naked, sweating, you put a towel and you just sweat all, all day, all night, 
and go work, come back and do whatever. Um, people's always in bad moods. So I think it's a great idea that they're doing air conditioning. Um, I know I've read of forums of people that are completely against it. You know, they're like, let them rot, they'll die. But you know, there are human beings. And I believe that, you know, not to accommodate their way of living, you know, but there's just so many different things that we as people and as human beings that we have love for one another, you know, there are certain things that we can't do to prevent it. And I think the main, most important factor is being educated in the system uh, before being released. And I think the federal system just started a reintegration program where they would get to um, go to a halfway house. It's mandatory that they are released to a halfway house. Through that halfway house, whatever your evaluations while you were incarcerated, they would then characterize those as to whether you had an anger issue, whether you had an addiction issue, blah, 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 blah. And then they will, they will use that out at the um, Dismas Charities, it's in Odessa, uh, and then they have counselors. There will be like four counselors uh, for so many individuals, and then they will go by their profile, and they're supposed to go and, and help you find the best substitute, well, the best um, uh, uh, solution for your certain situations. But to answer that, I think um, being involved in prison, you know, uh, we know that a lot of prisoners have anger issues. A lot of them uh, have, uh, they're like, uh, what do you call the word, when they don't get nobody to love on them and stuff. But, you know, overall, just make some type of a program where, or even people like me that can go in there and like, this is my passion. If I can go into a, a prison system and, and share my stories and, and, and tell, look, I was one of you, now, I mean, not to glorify me, by no means, if I glorify anyone, it's Jesus Christ, but it was to show them that, you know, this can happen, you know, if you put your mind to it. But that's really kind of a hard question to answer because there are so many programs out there, but we just don't know which one is actually helping. But I will tell you, Celebrate Recovery, has been really good for me lately and uh what do they do? They, they they are for any type of addictions, whether it's cigarettes, uh, pornography, drugs, alcohol. I think it started mostly on the drug and alcohol, but they have them here in Midland, Odessa. So if you know anyone or any of y'all know somebody that is having that kind of issue, um, they can go find them a celebrate recovery and um, go to it. It's once a week, once a day. There's also a um, Oh, what's the number? It's a program that we did that I learned that I actually incorporated into my family. Um, basically, what they would do is they would have a circle of inmates. Now, it was called the Snitch Program, okay? That's not the actual name, but we called it the Snitch Program. For example, let's say, let's say I was sitting here poking my nose, right? And I did the unthinkable and put my booger under the table. She seen it, so then she would write me up. I seen John Flores at this time on this date, and then she would fold up the piece of paper, she'd drop it in the box. At the end of the week, we would have a circle full of individuals, uh, and you would call me out, the, the counselor would pull out those papers, and they said, this was for John Flores. And then they would get one seat, they would sit it down like this, and then you would sit down in front of me and confront me. Now that did a lot of, of, of thinking for me because it, it was based on the negative behaviors and your good behaviors. So whenever we did something good, they would acknowledge it and they'd drop it in the good behavior box. So I, we, as an individual or, or an inmate, we were able to look at the different behaviors and, and we would get confronted. Now, it was a little bit, um, uh, what's the word, demeaning, like um, uh, embarrassing, because she's just calling me out that I seen you put boogers <laughs> under the table, you know? And so in that aspect, it was, it, it was a little embarrassing, but nonetheless, it made me stop putting boogers under the table. Now, I didn't actually get busted for that, but I'm saying, you know, me, but, but that right there was, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I have it written down at home. That actually helped me out a lot. Now, if they can incorporate something like that into all the county jails and stuff like that, 
I think it would make a, a, a direct impact on these individuals. Because exactly. people, they don't have that at the youth center level. Because that's where they need to start. The, uh, by just even the release, because these poor kids are released into homes with no structure. Right. And so you know they're going to reoffend. You know that the things are going to go south because yep. they can't do anything but go south in the Absolutely. environment that they're in. So unless you have some sort of program where they have a structured place to go where they could actually get into some sort of positive yes. routine. It's just going to persist. Uh, about, um, I don't know how many years ago, I'm just going to say, I had actually started, that's actually how my business kind of got started, <clears throat> is I had a, actually opened up a 501c3 called uh, the United Brothers Foundation, and that's what 